We are so glad to offer this webinar today entitled The Artist Entrepreneur, How to Monetize Your Art and Creative Skills. I want to just quickly do some housekeeping. You should all be on mute. We, we will have an opportunity to ask questions later on in the presentation. So if you could just keep your um, audio on mute until that time, we would appreciate it. If you have questions as we're going through the presentation, feel free to put those in the chat. We will have one monitoring those questions and we'll have an opportunity to ask those throughout the presentation. Um, I just wanna provide a quick overview of our office. We, like I said, we are the Office of Business Opportunities and we have a mission to help small minority women-owned and veteran-owned businesses grow and expand. And we do that through a variety of program areas. One of those is our commercial lending. We offer financial assistance to startup and existing businesses for growth, expansion, retention, and the creation of new jobs. And also offer assistance in redevelopment of commercial corridors. Brett Whiting is our loan officer. So if anybody has any interest in those loan programs. This meeting is being recorded. Um, feel free to give us a call. We will provide our contact information in the chat. Also, we have our contractor and supplier diversity area where we offer training and support for city initiatives that are designed to increase the local contractor's capacity to compete for government contracts and other procurement opportunities. It's really important that our procurement opportunities reflect the diversity of our great city. And we do that through various program areas, including our subcontractor outreach program, our mentor protege program, our local business enterprise preference policy, and our Columbia Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. Our staff members in that area are Kalina Ginyard, who's monitoring our chat. And also we have Latanya Germany and Juliet Nelly as well. Lastly, we have our technical assistance education and advocacy, where we offer business development assistance and courses for startups and existing businesses that are looking to grow or expand. Some of the topics we cover are marketing, the use of social media, business plan development, finances, legal issues, and more. We are always looking for unique and um, other ideas to offer training opportunities. We're so excited about this one. We've been talking about it for the past probably year and a half, and I'm very excited that we have finally have the opportunity to offer a training specific to our artists, entrepreneurs. Um, some of the upcoming webinars that we have are regarding financials, um, a financial series with Paul Smith. He's the CEO of Best Carolina LLC. So it's a three-part series. We're going to talk about are you bankable, um, the three C's of credit, cash flow projections, all of the essential um, items that you need to take into account when you have a business, including um, our artists, entrepreneurs. We also are going to offer a Profit First webinar with Stephen Hughes. He's the executive director of No Money, Inc. Um, and he's going to talk about profitability and what that looks like for your business. Um, we will provide additional information regarding those upcoming webinars in our newsletter. So if anyone does not receive our newsletter, please provide your um, email in the chat and let us know and we will add you to that newsletter list. We send that out every Friday. Um, and if lots of funding opportunities are on that list. Also, just information that's very important to our business community. So I encourage you to get on that newsletter. Also, you can follow us on social media, on Facebook or Twitter. Our contact information is here. We're located in downtown Columbia. You can give us a call at 803-545-3950, or you can email us at obo at Columbia SC. Gov, and we will be happy to discuss with you some of the resources that our office um, has. We also have a lot of um, partner relationships, and we'll be happy to connect you with someone if for some reason we cannot help you in whatever way you need. Next, I want to introduce Dr. Casey Whitener. She's a managing partner of Clemson Road Creative. She's also um, a lecturer at the University of South Carolina teaching strategic management and entrepreneurship. She was named a 2021 Fresh Voice in Humanities by the Governor of South Carolina for her work on the radio show, Write On SC. And she's with the South Carolina Writers Association. She's the author of two novels, After December and Before Pittsburgh, and two academic texts, Practical Entrepreneurism and Strategic Management. She's co-authored the nonfiction manual, Redesign Work Volume One, A Beginner's Guide to Autonomy, 
and she's a member of South Carolina Humanity Speakers Bureau. And she's delivered workshops for Pat Conroy Literary Center, Richland Library, and Fairfax County Library, among others. So at this time, I'm going to allow Casey to share her screen. Oh, Casey, before you um, share, I do want to introduce our director, Ms. Melissa, Melissa Lindler, who joined the call. Just want to give her an opportunity to welcome everyone before we get started. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Thank you so much, Dr. K, for joining us and doing this webinar for us. Um, this is something that we actually wanted to do in person uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, so Dr. Whitener has been working with us and working with us and working with us, and we finally brought it to fruition. So I'm happy to have you all join, join this session. Um, if this is your first time attending a OBO event, you're going to enjoy it. Um, make sure you don't, don't let this be your last one. We offer a number of free uh, courses and trainings, and we definitely want to make sure that we're reaching everybody. Um, all of our entrepreneurs, inclu including our artists and our creative artists and our creative uh, entrepreneurs. So you all have a business too, and we want you to be able to maximize your profits and also understand the value that you bring. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Casey? I'm so glad to see you all. It, it's like a little reunion of the usual suspects over here, which is making me really happy. <laughs> um, and so I see quite a few names that I know, people that I'm familiar with, and I appreciate you coming to support not just me, but hopefully to support your business as an artist entrepreneur. And Melissa's exactly right, and Aisha as well. We have been talking about this for some time. It came out of some of the work that I did with the uh, Arts Commission, and I know C is here as well, and a few of our other Arts Commission participants. So one of the things that happened a few years ago, uh, I was trying to build the radio show right on SC, and I just needed a little bit of help because as you might be aware, radio shows are, are pay to play. So you've got to pay to have access to the radio. And while Kevin Cohen is a good friend, and I just love 100.7 The Point, he was not going to give me that airspace for free. And so I was going around looking to figure out how could I finance this radio show that I really wanted to do about writing. And um, one of the things that came up was this artist venture grant. And I know we've got at least uh, one uh, recipient of one of those grants here. So hi, Sunny, it's good to see you again. Uh, one of the things that came about was when you apply for this artist venture grant through the Arts Commission, you have this extensive application and then you sit in front of this uh, committee and you tell them about yourself and about this business idea that you have. And then they decide how much money to allocate to your, toward your venture and then you match it and then you have these reports and this kind of thing. But what I found was as we did this, I was super excited and then we got the cash and we're going to be able to pay Kevin and we're going to put the radio show up. And then we just started running with our business and then COVID hit. And so we didn't get the advantage of having mentorship and real business coaching coming from uh, the Arts Commission. And so this past year, when uh, they went to uh, award a new round of grants and C asked me to be on the committee that would help with these new artists that were applying for these grants, the big conversation that we were having, including um, Lee from uh, One Columbia and some of the other members of the committee was, how do we educate these artists on the business side? How do we help them understand exactly how to run a business in addition to being these creative professionals and creating this very unique art that's going out into the world? And so fortunately that was a line of thinking that Melissa and I had already kind of been on before pandemic. And so I kind of roped in our humanities and our uh, arts commission folks too. And I was like, hey, let's all get together and do something. Um, and so we're so grateful to the OBO for being the host for this and to all of our artist entrepreneur network for participating. And uh, we're hoping that after we do our 90 minute sort of quick view today, that it's going to lead us into a longer session, hopefully fingers crossed on site um, and in person where we'll get to hear from some real artist entrepreneurs who are making a go of it in a number of different ways that I'll tell you about today. So this is me. This is kind of the rundown of who I am. And Aisha gave us a little bit of that bio, but I do teach entrepreneurship at the University of South Carolina. So some of the tools I'm going to be introducing you to come directly out of that curriculum. And we're actually going to be working through them today. So grab a pen and some paper or open up another browser window for a Google Doc that you can type into while we're working today, because I really do want you to spend some time thinking about your business and how these ideas and how these tools apply specifically to your business. 
So let's start with uh, our, our kind of overview, our agenda. What are we going to work on? We're going to start with some vocabulary, a couple of terms that are related to businesses. Then we're going to look at some business models. So you can think about maybe this is how you want to earn revenue or how you want to set up your organization. We're going to talk about some tools that are available to you, uh, including the business model canvas. Some of you might be very familiar with that. We're going to work on that. And we also have a value proposition canvas that we're going to spend some time with today. We're going to get a visit from somebody at the city to talk about licensure and some of the support networks, as we mentioned, OBO and One Million Cups and the Women's Business Center at Benedict College and all these other organizations that are available to support you as you're building your business that maybe as artists we're not as familiar with, but as business owners, we've got to get familiar with. And then lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about funding options, um, not just the grants that are out there that are just uh, generous sort of boosts in the right direction, but also some of the ways that you can uh, create additional streams of income and additional streams of revenue to cover things like emergencies such as the pandemic when it hit last year so lots to do in 90 minutes um, but hopefully you'll be taking lots of notes and at any time you've got questions throw them in the chat if there's something that seems specifically relevant to what we're talking about or somebody needs for me to slow down for a second whoever's monitoring the chat by all means just like poke your head up and be like hey casey stop uh because i have a tendency to just kind of monologue and go pretty fast and i don't want to lose anybody so Let's start here. This is a really useful pyramid that came to me in our, our entrepreneurship classes, um, actually from some marketing people, which if anybody, those of you who know me really well, you know, I think in general, marketing people can uh, be kind of useless. And so the idea that they had, I'm kidding, that they had this, uh, that they had this pyramid to me was like genius, right? So I want you to think about what kind of product or service do you actually have? When you think about your art, and I'm going to kind of pick on Sunny because Sunny's a, a sculptor, right? And so he's got clay uh, bowls and cups and mugs and things like that. Think about what is that product do for your customer? Because remember, we're talking about building a business. And so the business has got to be focused on who's going to buy from you. If we are simply uh, making jewelry because we love making jewelry and it doesn't really matter if anybody's wearing it, then we don't really have a business. We have a hobby, right? And there's nothing wrong with a hobby. But when we want to monetize, we have to really get laser focused on who's going to buy the product and why are they going to buy the product. So the couple of levels here, the very bottom level, and this is not because it's bad or anything like that, but it's the most general level is a functional product. Do you have something that helps other people make money? Do you have something that helps other people reduce their own costs? So one of these is like there's an app out there that if you bring in the app on your phone, it will monitor all of your subscriptions and it will tell you which subscriptions you're paying for but not using so that at the end of every month, you can discontinue those subscriptions you're not using. This is a product that helps people make money, right? Like by reducing how much they're spending. So think about the thing that you make, your particular product or service. How are you helping people on the functional level if at all, right? Are you helping them to save time? Are you helping them to connect with others? Are you integrating with something they currently have and giving them a chance to make that thing better, right? Are you reducing their effort in some way? The second level is the emotional level. And I think most of our art falls here, right? Most of our art sits in the emotional level and that we're showing somebody something that is fun and entertaining, right? Like my friend, Reagan Teller, who's a novelist, we're gonna talk about her a little bit later. It's about being entertained, right? Or maybe something we're doing is reducing people's anxiety. So we're giving them soothing bath bombs or soothing aromatherapy candles, like my friend Tazima Brown, right? In which case we're helping them to reduce their anxiety anxiety, or maybe promote their wellness. So a lot of times our art product or our art service is in that emotional category. And then the next category up is life changing. <laughs> this is a little bit of a take on, right? Like, man, I'm going to be a motivational speaker. And my art is to deliver these motivational speeches. And I'm going to help people attain their dreams or their goals, right? Or I'm going to be a life coach. And I'm going to be somebody that helps people self actualize, find their purpose and that kind of thing. Uh, another one of our usual suspects around here is my good friend, Stephanie Kirkland, who I always tell everybody she's my life coach. I don't pay her, but she does it anyway. And <laughs> Stephanie Kirkland is one of these folks that has that motivation product, right? Her service is to help other people see what they can become and then to help keep them motivated and stay on that track of self-actualization. Something that you might have that's life-changing from an artist's perspective 
is you may be creating heirlooms for people. There's a really great store over in Shandon called Bella Beads. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Bella Beads, but Bella Beads will take flowers from your wedding, from funeral arrangements, from just anywhere you get these flowers, and they'll preserve them into these tiny little beads that are uh, jewelry. And then you can make bracelets out of them, you can make charms out of them, you can make keychains out of them. And so if, for example, the way we did it was we took the flowers off of my grandfather's uh, funeral off of his casket and they were orange and purple because he's a huge Clemson fan and we made these little orange and purple beads and everybody got a bracelet and so now we're all wearing these beads that are heirlooms for us they commemorate my, my grandfather's life having been here and his passing and so those kinds of art right if that's the art that you're creating it could very well be life-changing art for people right so think about your product I'm going to stop monologuing here for a second <laughs> think about your product and and find one or two two or three of these where you think your product might actually fit. You can drop it in the chat or you can just chat it to yourself and your notes, however you wanna do that, just give it some thought. So we do, Casey, we do have a couple of comments in the chat. Um, oh, great. One said emotional and functional. Another said emotion, function. Another said wellness and fun. Okay, good. Wellness and fun. So yeah, these badges here, right? These little circles, that's how we're gonna get detailed about it, right? So if you're somebody that provides, maybe if you're a painter and you're creating canvases, you might be adding on the emotional side, attractiveness to somebody's home, right? Um, I know a gal that owns a t-shirt shop where she goes out and finds vintage t-shirts and then she resells them on Etsy. She's a nostalgia, right? She provides people with emotional nostalgia payoff, right? Because then they're getting the like seven up t-shirts and they're just say no t-shirts and that kind of thing. Okay, so built a little bit on this. Uh, a couple years ago, I got a chance to go to the Wofford University uh, Terrier Startup Challenge and I met this gal who was making these doggy doingles. And basically her story was that her dog had gotten a plastic toy, he destroyed the plastic toy and it poisoned him and he died. And she didn't want that to happen to anybody else ever again. So she set about trying to find a durable toy that would not include poisoned ingredients. And she came upon these fleece weaving um, techniques where she could weave together strands of fleece when fleece is biodegradable and it is safe for ingestion. And she could weave them together in a way that they would become very stiff and very strong. And she created these doggy doingles and this business associated with this. Um, that was the name of the business. All of us were kind of like, okay. <laughs> but she brought them to us and we got to feel them and feel how strong they were. And she set up her business on Etsy and she was doing a pretty good amount of business. Uh, the couple of questions that we had for her in the startup challenge was materials, right? Cost of materials. How much did it take? How much time did it take for her to make each one of these products? And once her business really took off, how was she going to be able to maintain that supply and demand? How was she going to be able to set aside enough of her personal inventory her personal time to be able to make all these dog toys. So just a quick example of, a, of an entrepreneur that's out there taking her art and having a story behind it and a purpose and a, a reason for building that business. And we're going to come a little bit back to her in just a few minutes. So this is what's called the value proposition canvas. And this is a chance for you to do a little bit more work. Are you ready? You would think we would read things typically from left to right, but what we're going to do is start on the far right with this customer jobs, right? So all of your customers have something they need to do. They have a job to be done. And this is a theory that comes out of Harvard Business Review, uh, the late um, Christian, Christensen, uh, Professor Christensen from Harvard, he came up with this idea of the jobs to be done. And he tells this story about McDonald's wanting to improve their milkshakes. And so they had to figure out who's drinking milkshakes. And Christensen and his researchers sat and started paying attention to the people who were buying McDonald's milkshakes. Turns out most of them were being bought in the morning. And when they talked to the people who were buying the milkshakes, it was because they had a long commute. 
and they were buying the milkshakes for a couple of reasons. These are customer jobs. The customer is hiring the milkshake for a specific job, right? The milkshake was tasty, right? It felt like a treat. So they were feeling like they were rewarded. It didn't go away right away. Like it didn't, they didn't suck it down really fast. They had to take their time and they had this long commute so they could suck on it the whole way to work, right? And it was delicious, right? It's going to make them feel better about the day and about the fact that they have to go through this whole thing. Plus it wasn't very expensive. So the customer has these needs, right? They have these jobs they need to do. And the milkshake was fulfilling those customer needs. So as you might under, ex expect, McDonald's said, well, how can we do a better milkshake? And if you've ever had one of those frozen coffee drinks from McDonald's, you're experiencing the results of this particular research. Because the reason they did the frozen coffee drinks is because of this research, right? So think about your customer and the person that you are creating your art for, the person that's going to buy this thing that you've created and love this thing that you've created. What are they trying to do? They might be trying to have a, an attractive coffee mug as their particular coffee mug that they use at the office, right? They might want an entire set of attractive coffee mugs. They might be looking for something unique that other people don't have, right? Some piece of conversation as far as maybe it's a painting that they wanna hang in their office or they wanna hang in their living room and they want a conversation piece, right? Whatever the job to be done, your customer is coming to buy your product because they want it to fill a specific need. So give that a little bit of thought. What kinds of, and you know this from the people you've already sold something to, right? It could be that you make uh, customized tops or skirts. Maybe they're tie-dyed skirts. Uh, my friend at Loose Lucy's, they sell these great tie-dyed skirts. My daughter loves them. Why does she need the, the tie-dyed skirt? Well, she wants a skirt that nobody else has. End of story. She wants an original piece of clothing. That's the reason she buys the tie-dyed skirt. So the first question is, what's the job to be done? What is the person trying to accomplish? On both sides of this customer wheel, you can see that there's trouble on the bottom and there's rewards on the top. So the pains are the things that get in the way of us being able to do these things. So think back to that milkshake, right? Um, I, I want to have something I can drink all the way to the office, but um, coffee is going to cool down. Coffee is going to get cold, so I'm not going to be able to drink it the whole way. So one of my pains might be that the temperature doesn't stay consistent with the beverage that I've been choosing, right? Those pains that your customer is experiencing is forcing that customer to look for a new solution. They're looking to you to provide them with something they haven't had before. So when you're thinking about your product, you want to think about how your product specifically addresses those pains. So the McDonald's milkshake, it's not going to cool down. It's already cold, right? We just want to make sure it's not going to melt completely by the time they get to work, right? We need to keep it a relative consistency for them so that they can have the same type of beverage experience their whole way to work. Think about your customer wanting to buy an attractive piece of art for their home, but maybe the pain is that they're always really expensive. Or maybe the pain is that it seems like if I buy art in a place I can afford it, it looks like everybody else's art. Or maybe the pain is that uh, they don't have the specific color palette that I need for my particular home, right? Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the chicken man art where they're all the chickens, right? But they're, they're probably thousands of them all over the city, but they're in every single color you can possibly imagine. So if you like the chicken art and you think this is something Columbia specific, but it doesn't have the right color for you, you can find the right color. And that's what he's done in creating his art product is he's made one that addresses a specific pain, which is that the color scheme might not be the one that you want. If all he was making was garnet and black chickens, I don't know how many he would sell, right? There's a lot of Carolina people here, but it's not all Carolina people, right? But he's got orange and purple ones, and he's got blue ones, and he's got red, white, and blue ones, right? He's got navy blue and white. He's got all these different colors so that that artist is meeting the customer's needs. He's saying, what does the customer want, and how do I create an art that's going to be what they want that's going to help meet those pains, right? And provide for them some gains. It's going to make them feel good about the fact that they've invested their money in this art. The value proposition canvas is a way to think really specifically about how your customer, your buyer affects your creative process. Because most of us as artists 
create because we have a place inside of us that needs to be fulfilled, right? So the books that I've written after December and before Pittsburgh, these are characters that I know that I love and I wanted to get them out into the world. That's a pretty selfish perspective on my side, right? I'm over here like, I don't care who reads it. I just want to publish my book. It's a story I have to tell. I'm going to write it and make all my friends buy it. When we published the second one, my publisher was like, I need for you to be very specific about how you're going to get people engaged with this book. The first one might have been your catharsis, your art, your opus to the world, but the second one's going to have to sell some copies, Casey. <laughs> the second one's got to be focused on your customers. So we started thinking about what do the people who read After December, what did they like about After December? What did they not like about After December? And how can I fix some of those not likes, right? How can I take those pains away and create some gains for them? The second product becomes a way to respond directly to my customers when they said, hey, I really like this, but maybe you could make it like that. And I go, okay, I can do that. I can change my art for you. And this is not an any way taking away from the integrity of the art that you're building. This is about monetizing. It's about earning money for the art that you've created. And the only way to do that is to respond to your customers and give your customers what they want. I'm not saying sell out. We're not all musicians here, but there are a lot of musicians who get that way about it, right? I'm not going to sell out. Okay. Nobody's asking you to sell out. We still want the art to be yours. But when you think of building your business, you know this as well as anybody else. You put one product and another side by side. A lot of people are buying the one, it sells out. Nobody bought the other one. I wonder why, I don't know why. Start asking them, what is it about this product you didn't like? Why did you feel like it was not worth the investment, right? Start spending some time really getting to know your customers and asking them for input on what you've done for them. This is how you maintain a relationship with them, but it's also how you continue to iterate your product and make it better for them so that they keep buying from you. As a writer, it's about readers. So talking to my readers, spending time with my readers, uh, they hate my main character. Let me just put that out there, okay? <laughs> the main character is this, um, it's, it takes place in the 90s. My main character is this 22 year old entitled white guy that like basically thinks his life is awful when in fact he pretty much has everything he ever could want, right? So just about everybody reads my book and they're like, God, that guy's such a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of is. So in the second book, as I'm writing the second book, I'm like, how do we make this guy a little bit more likable? How do I make sure that people want to hang with this guy for longer than, than they maybe would have otherwise hung with him? Um, and building those scenes in there to create a character that, the, uh, that people read and they go, okay, I really understand where his angst comes from. I really do appreciate, you know, the, the sense of entitlement that he has and, and his awareness of it makes me feel better about the whole thing, right? Maybe. I don't know. Point is responding to your customers. So once your customers start telling you what they like and what they don't like, what they struggled with and what they need you to do, building your product or your art in a way that meets those needs, that is the key to monetizing your art. The key is to be responsive to the audience that you're building. Are there questions in the chat related to that or can people kind of understand this value proposition, Candace? There's nothing in the, in the chat right now. Okay, so I'm gonna pop, I'm gonna keep moving forward then. You can take a picture of this canvas or you can even just Google the value proposition canvas and find it for yourself. Um, there's some really good videos on how, like what each of these boxes mean that'll walk you through the details of it. But I highly recommend spending a good bit of time thinking through your art business and your customer jobs to be done and figuring out what they struggle with and how you can relieve that pain. One of the struggles might be simply access to your art. If you have a studio in uh, Charleston, for example, right? And you've got people that wanna buy your product, but they're not in Charleston. They're not going to be coming to Charleston. How do they get access to your product? Uh, can they see your product without uh, having to come all the way to Charleston and come into your studio and look at your work? Or do you have, do you need to build a website so that they can go online and they can see your art? Do you need to offer a, a, a tour, right? Maybe you need to go and visit other artist studios and 
and set your stuff up there and ask them to bring their customers in to see your work. What are some of the things you can do to relieve your customers' pains, right? They may love your work, but just not be ready to buy because of whatever reason. And you might be able to relieve that pain by doing something really easy, like creating a YouTube video demonstrating the thing, right? Or by putting together an Instagram, what are they called? The video things on Instagram, a reel, an Instagram reel that shows them how the product actually gets put to use, right? Or how durable the product is or how beautiful it looks hanging in somebody else's house, right? There's a lot of different ways that you can um, relieve those pains with some of the marketing work that you do and some of the business work that you do. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is gonna feel probably a little crazy for those of you who are like, I'm just making my art. I don't really know what else to do. Um, so just breathe through it, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> and you don't have to absorb it all right now. Um, again, you can take a picture of this or Aisha can send you the slide deck and you can kind of spend a little bit more time thinking about it. But the idea of building a business is meeting your customer's needs, delivering the product for your customer, right? And then you have some limitations in an art business because a lot of times the art is your creative endeavor. It requires your personal touch, your ability to deliver the art, to build the art, right? But sometimes once the art is built, like in the case of a book, right? Once the, the book is written, now it's just a matter of going through how do my customers interact with my product? How do they learn about it? How do they research it versus other books, right? How do they see what it looks like? How do they understand the features and the benefits of it? Do I have testimonials, people telling a, a potential readers how good this book really is, right? Then when they're going to make their decision, do I make it really easy for them? Can they simply see what they want on my website, click buy, and then I'll ship it to them, right? This is how Tazima Brown and Sunrise Artisan got through the pandemic as they set up a very robust online ordering capability where once somebody saw it, they wanted it, she could put it in a box and off it went. Um, they had real-time inventory on their website to make sure that when people bought something, they had it available to be able to send it to them right away. And we'll talk a little bit more about Sunrise in just a minute. But this decide factor, how do I get them to agree and then facilitate that sale? A lot of times our artists entrepreneurs are using other platforms. So I mentioned Etsy for the doggy doingles, right? Uh, we use um, Amazon for books. You might be selling on Amazon. You might be selling on Etsy. You might be selling on um, eBay or any other of these sales platforms. And one of the things that you've got to figure out is can your customers easily use that platform and find your work and buy your product from that platform? Or do you simply want to do it through your own website where you can facilitate a sale using a point of sale program like Square or uh, even um, uh, QuickBooks has a point of sale program. Uh, you can also put a cart on your WordPress site. WordPress actually has some of that sales capability. So if you don't want to go to Etsy and kind of get lost among all the other creators, you could build a shopping cart on your own site. But those decisions that you're making about it are specifically related to your customer journey and asking yourself, where does my customer find my stuff? How does my customer prefer to buy my stuff? And then am I facilitating that sale? Some of us go to Soda City and other markets like that, right? Where you're going to go on the weekend or you might go on, you know, a specific day of the week and you've got to figure out a way to take cash, right? And make change. But then also maybe you're using a square solution to be able to take those transactions. And how do you facilitate that transaction and how much are you losing in that transaction as well? Because there are service fees for using these kinds of products. So giving some thought to does your customer normally pay with a credit card or do they normally pay with cash uh, would they prefer to have a you know a flat fee twenty dollars or uh, am I going to be able to make change for them what is it going to look like when I start charging sales tax at that place all of these questions show up in that decide piece where you're actually facilitating the sale of your art to another person the engage is how you make sure they get the product that you have 
sold to them. So again, if you're at something like a Soda City and you've done, maybe you are a knitter and so you have all these scarves and these hats and these baby boots and they're all orange and purple because we're only going to sell them to clubs. I'm just kidding. You're going to sell them to all kinds of football fans. So you have gold and black and you have um, our gold and purple, right, for Benedict College and you've got uh, the garnet and black for Carolina. So you have all these like sports fan themed scarves and hats and baby booties and mittens and that sort of thing. And somebody comes and they go, oh, I just love these knitted mittens and I'd like to buy them right now. And you go, here you go. And you just hand them to them. That's pretty easy, right? <laughs> they gave you cash, you gave them the product. If you're selling jewelry, that's the same way, right? But maybe somebody comes and they go, I really like these earrings, but could you do them in these colors? And you go, I can. If you pay me now, I will go home and I will make those earrings for you and I will send them to you. What does that look like, right? What does that exchange look like? And if you've been working some of these festivals, you've already had those conversations. You've already said to people like, gosh, I, I don't do them in those colors. But I guess I could for you, if you're willing to pay you know, today, I'll go and I'll buy the materials and I'll do them for you or something to that effect. As an artist, a lot of times you're being asked to tweak your art just a little bit to get what the customer wants. And remember in our previous value proposition, that's the way to maintain that revenue, right? To meet their needs and give them what they need. And then ultimately retention. I don't know how many of you have an email list, but um, I'm really shocked just about every time I go to Soda City and nobody asks me to sign up for their email list. I think um, there we have a sense that email lists are sort of an archaic way to stay in touch with your customers. But in fact, it serves as a customer relationship management database. So if you have just a $10 a month subscription to MailChimp and you're sending people emails once a month or twice a month, telling them these are the new products or these are the places you're going to be, then the, they might have decided they weren't going to go to Arts on the Ridge, but then they saw that you were going to be there. And now they're going to go because they want to see what you have to offer. So staying in touch with your customers and creating a process where you keep them engaged with you, where you keep them relating to you and wanting new products, that's a huge part of your customer journey. Building not just customers, but fans, right? Creating an audience for yourself so that they're staying in touch with everything you have coming out and coming down the pipeline. It's a big deal for writers because once somebody reads your book and they really like it, they're likely to look for a second and a third and a fourth, right? And Amazon tries to make that pretty easy. But if I relied on Amazon to, to connect with my customers, I'd be in a lot of bad shape, right? Because Amazon's got a million sellers out there, but I'm just me. And so what I do instead is if you want to participate, you want to come and see me at a, a thing like this, I'm going to ask you to sign up for my email list. And then I'm going to send you an email once a month or so until it comes time to launch a new book. And then I'm going to email you every week, every week. <laughs> hey, don't forget the new book is coming up. Um, but yeah, so this, this process where you're thinking about where is my customer in the journey and what am I doing at each of these stages of my customer journey is a way of moving out of the mindset of an artist and into the mindset of a business owner, right? Now you're thinking about what can I do to get their attention to get them to consider my product, right? To get them to decide to part with their money in favor of what I'm selling, right? They're giving up their money for me. So I wanna make sure I'm helping them make that right decision and then engage them through the process. You know, what did you think of the product? How did you feel about the product? Was it everything you thought it was going to be? And if not, why not, right? And then retain them and ask them to share my product with everybody else in their community. This customer journey as you're building your audience and bringing people in, if you're a musician, if you're an author, if you're a painter, a sculptor, a, a fashion designer, all of these artists need an audience. They need somebody who's going to continue to buy their product, promote their product. And this customer journey is a way for you to break down each and every activity you're doing and make sure that what you're doing is helping to build that, that audience base. Any questions on this? I know it's kind of overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, we do have some questions in the chat. Um, okay, good. The first one, um, they wanted to know uh, regarding your book, did you self-publish your book? I did not. I did not. I have a publisher that's here in town. Um, her name is Alexa Bigwarf, and the title of the, the press is called Chrysalis Press. And um, she and I are good friends, and, and she published it. 
Okay. The second question is regarding the customer journey diagram. Um, the participant wants to know what if you are selling a service, not an item? Yeah, so the service is even more important, right? Because a service can be a one and done where they get what you have to offer and then they're gone forever, or they can get a little bit of what you have to offer and then you can build more custom services to respond to their needs. Um, Stephanie is a great example of this, Stephanie Kirkland with IPOM. So she has In Pursuit of Me, which was addressing women whose uh, identities had kind of gotten swept up in their role as mom or mother or employee, and she was helping them to get back to their identity as a woman and as an individual. And as she started this journey with these folks, with this audience she was building, she found that quite a few of them had a spiritual component that wasn't really being met. And so she launched this Bible study called Ezer. And the Bible study matches that IPOM kind of journey. And it's just an additional curriculum that she's able to offer. So the services are even more important to be really in touch with your customer. Because once you provide that initial service, they're either going to use you again and again and again, because maybe you're like, you clean pools or something like that. And so they're going to need you every week <laughs> on a subscription basis, or um, they're only going to use you the one time and then they're kind of good to go and off they go. And now you've lost them, right? So, okay, I did this thing for you and it was really great. What else do you need done? And should I be considering adding that service to my portfolio? Okay, that's all we have right for right now. Okay, good. Um, and like I said, this is a, it, it might feel pretty complex, but if you take a picture of it and then break it down, just like in the other one, think about each one of these and say, what am I really doing? Like, what are the activities in each of these pieces? Um, and that will build out your day too. I would say a lot of times when we think about uh, running our own business as entrepreneurs, we get kind of caught up in like the busyness of business, right? Like I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram and I'm doing my this and I'm doing my that. Um, and, and, and then it's like, but I don't really feel like I'm getting any traction. I don't feel like I'm really building the audience I'm looking for. And if we go back to our customer journey, it could be because there's a gap here somewhere. There's something I'm not doing for them and they've wandered away, right? <laughs> and, I, and I don't want that. So I got to figure out how do I make sure I'm, I'm in touch with them at every single stage. I mentioned Sunrise a couple of times, um, my pal Tazima, hopefully you all know her too. And if you don't, go buy uh, five points, tell her I sent you. Um, I know the OBO knows her, she speaks so highly of you guys. Um, she, as soon as I saw her after pandemic, she was like, I gotta tell you that Office of Business Opportunities, they're amazing. Um, so thank you so much. I, I know I don't have to thank you for supporting her, but gosh, I just love her to pieces. So Tazima does bath bombs, which I mean, the first time she even told me that's what she did, I was like, like who buys that? Um, and this is her art. I know, Melissa, this is her art. This is her creativity. These are personal care items that she makes from organic, um, non-allergen uh, types of materials. And she really spends a lot of time thinking about the quality of the product that she's building, the skincare capabilities of these products, right? She's really, really passionate about creating products that people are going to just love um, and, and just not be able to live without. And if you go down to Sunrise, she will, she will tell you exactly what you need down there. But what I think is so fascinating about the Sunrise story is that she was just kind of getting up and going on Instagram, just kind of thinking about a digital business and starting to get some traction on the digital business before the pandemic pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit and they had to close their doors and people couldn't come and buy their bath bombs in person anymore, she had to start she had to shift, right? She had to start shipping. And once she started mailing things out, right? Shipping things just to her local customers who just needed refills, she actually grew her business exponentially because people found her on Instagram, they found her on Facebook, they found her through all of these different digital platforms that she was concentrating her efforts on that customer journey. And now she's sold into 48 states and four continents. And if you go into Sunrise Artisan on um, in Five Points, you'll see this gigantic map on the wall with pins to every place that they have sent bath bombs and soaps and personal care products. Um, and it's overwhelming. I mean, the last time I was in there, like I just wanted to cry. I was so happy for her and what she's been able to do there. There are ex 
um, alternatives to a brick and mortar retail store. So we're going to talk a little bit now about business models and the business model that Tazima has is a retail business model, right? Which is where somebody comes in, they say, this is what I want. And she gives it to them. And you can do that in pop-ups, right? Like at festivals and that sort of thing, or you can do it in a traditional brick and mortar, like she has in five points where she pays rent, she pays overhead and people come in, you know, on, on specific hours of the day and over the weekend and that sort of thing. Thing. Asking yourself what your business model is going to be is a critical question for an entrepreneur because it's going to determine not just how you respond to the customer journey or how you build the customer journey, but how do you operate your whole supply chain? How do you get the products that you need? How do you pay for the products that you need? How do you negotiate the fees for those products, right? If you're buying a lot of clay from the same provider and you're paying the same amount every single time, there's gotta be some kind of advantages to that, right? Uh, so we're gonna talk about how do you identify who those critical relationships are. Part of your business model is how do you get paid, right? Are they paying for the product at one at a time or are you charging them a subscription and sending them a certain type of product every month, right? So we talk about that too. It also determines how you pay others. Are you going on a net 30 where you're going to be um, buying things on credit and then paying your suppliers after you've gotten paid? Or are you going to pay upfront in cash for everything and hope that you recoup those expenses, right? And then lastly, how do you advertise and how do you market? Who are your customers and how do you reach them and how do you talk to them about what you do? All of these things are determined by your business model. Um, and it seems like, man, that must be, again, like super overwhelming. But we've got this really nifty tool <laughs> that's going to show you how to do this. So I'm going to get to that. That's like two slides away. But first, let me talk through a couple of these business models that you might be familiar with. I mentioned the transactional product or the transactional service. Um, what I'm doing for Melissa right now is a transactional service. She, I, I do webinars, I do speaking engagements, and she said, could you do this? And I said, yes, and then she paid me, and here I am. So transactional service, right? Pretty basic. It's the same with products, right? I've made this book, I sold you this book, and we're done here. That may very well be the, the service that you have. You might also find though that people are maybe reluctant to invest in your product or maybe they don't have the money right now to pay for your product upfront. So you might consider something like a subscription or a freemium service. So you're familiar with freemium and things like Pandora, uh, Spotify, um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn's a big one, right? Where you can do a lot on the site for free, but if you want to do some of these extra things, you have to pay a premium price. So you might have the same thing. If, for example, you have a creator space, a maker space, and you let people come in and use your maker space for free, but if they're going to be here for longer than a certain period of time, or they're going to be here more days than other days, things like that, then you start saying, okay, you can get more time for this amount of money. Um, I like this idea in the studio space, where especially if you need a studio for your own art, but you can't necessarily afford the studio space, you can lend that studio space when it's not being used to other artists. And you might have a freemium deal there. You might say you know, to Aisha, hey, you can have it on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but if you need it more than that, or if you go over your allotted four hours, I'm gonna need for you to start paying something for this space, right? But I'm not in there anyway, so why can't she have it for a couple hours a week, right? We do this on the writer's side where we have these writer critique groups and we go in and we share our pages and I give people feedback on their pages, six pages at a time. They can come every single week and I'll give them pages, six pages at a time. But if they want me to read the entire thing and give them feedback on the entire thing, then that's a fee associated with that, right? So the freemium model is a good way to get people introduced to your service or to your product. And it's also a good way to add an additional stream of revenue to help offset some of the costs of your own business. Subscriptions are all the rage right now, um, and they're I think <laughs> I think they're super trendy because younger people love subscriptions. My students love this thing. Like I have, I would say every student in my class has upwards of a dozen subscriptions. You're most familiar with subscription model with things like Netflix, um, HBO Max, right? These apps, Disney Plus, where you pay them once a month and you have access to all of their content. This works very well for content providers. So if you're somebody that does 
uh, videos, right? If you're teaching people how to do something, if that's one of your streams of revenue that you're going to be doing instructional videos, a subscription model might work there where somebody will pay a small amount every month to have access to all of that content. The subscription models that my students are addicted to are these like random boxes of stuff where they'll pay like, I don't know if any of you guys have these, but like you'll pay like 12 bucks a month and they'll send you cosmetics. Like you have no idea what's coming in this box. And my students love it because they said it's like a little surprise every month where they get this box and they're like, look at all these fun things. I was like getting, it's like paying for a present for yourself every month, um, but they love them. And so that may be something you consider too. If you make, uh, for example, if you're somebody that does multiple um, kinds of fabric things, right? And so maybe you've got scarves and hats and I don't know, um, but you have a, a couple of different products that you might be able to put into a subscription box and then mail them to people. That might be, a, a, I don't know how many artists would want to put multiple items in the same thing and sell it for a flat rate, but could be a thing. I don't know, maybe you're a jewelry collector, you do that. Um, I would say on the subscription model where it really gets in um, for artists is again, that how-to piece. So you can teach other people how to do what you do. This is called being like the chefs, right? So our chefs go on TV, they show you how to cook the meal from beginning to end, right? They give you the recipe, right? <laughs> they demonstrate their cooking technique. They just give it away. And why do they do that? It's because they know you can't do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's because they know that as good as you think you are, you're probably still not Emeril Lagasse because you don't have his 35 years worth of experience, which is fine. But what it means is that he can create a subscription and even you as an artist, as a musician, you can create a subscription where people are watching your videos or they're um, coming to your, to your sessions, right? You're having like group sessions and you're teaching people how to play guitar. And this week we're gonna be covering G chord or something, I don't know. And everybody can say, oh, I'm gonna be able to come and I'm gonna be part of this lesson. Or maybe they're gonna watch the video afterwards. So as an artist, you can create some of that same kind of community, those same kinds of subscription services that get to that building of the audience. You're starting to build your audience by teaching people how to do what you do, uh, knowing full well that they're not gonna do exactly what you do. They're not gonna play your songs. They're not gonna make your art, but teaching them how to do something like what you do gives them a chance to really become invested in the product that you're creating and the product that you're building. This is another piece, the community, the uh, cohort or the platform. We're gonna talk a little bit about that when we talk to funding options where you intentionally build your audience and then your audience becomes patrons for you and they pay you to do the work that you're doing. I know a lot of writers who are doing that. And then the razor and blade strategy is basically where you sell something really inexpensive because all of the um, supplements they need are, are, are much more expensive. So say for example, you would sell, uh, if you're an incense person, right? And what you do is handcrafted homemade incense, uh, whether it's on sticks or little cones or whatever, and you might sell them the incense burner pretty cheap, um, you know, eight, eight bucks or something like that. But then when they go to buy your handcrafted incense that you've made that you've slaved over, it's like $30 a pack, right? But they love it because it smells really good and it makes their house wonderful. So they continue to stay, stay part of that. So that's the razor and blade strategy where the initial buy is pretty low, but then after that is they're trying to um, supply it by the supplies for it. It's a little bit more expensive. Now, I haven't seen anybody do this with incense specifically, but if you got into Scentsy, I don't know if you're familiar with Scentsy, but it was a, for a while there was a direct sales model Scentsy, and you could buy the um, little burning, I don't know what they were called, but like they were like, they were uh, little canisters, not canisters. I'm going to miss it, but it basically had like a, it had a, a candle in the bottom and then you put the dish on top and you pour the Scentsy oil in it and the candle would warm the Scentsy oil and it would make the whole house smell, right? And um, the Scentsy products were only able to be used with Scentsy oil. And so the Scentsy oil was really where the money was, right? <laughs> the more Scentsy oils you were selling, the better off you'd be. Um, just putting that out there, razor and blade, for, for whatever it's worth. The long tail, which I kind of jumped over, the long tail is where somebody does a big buy on the front side. And this might be, if you are a content creator, this might be the big buy, right? They might buy your full course of how to publish your novel. And then over the course of time after that, they're, set, they're buying smaller things like little one-off products, maybe a $5 this or a $10 that or a $25 that. 
But the long tail is about that big buy on the front end. They say, I really want to invest in this. And then they stay engaged over time at a lower entry level. Um, so a lot of different business model options for you. Once you start thinking about what kind of product and service you offer and then selecting one. And I will say this too. You're not married to this model. Once you start it, if you realize you're not making any money at this, ditch it. Right, like do something else <laughs> because sometimes thinking specifically about COVID and pandemic, if you had a transactional product and you were going on site and you were selling your product at Soda City every weekend, you were probably doing a good amount of business. But if Soda City gets canceled and you can't be there, you're going to lose out on that revenue, right? And so that transactional product business model might not be the best business model for you. It might be better if you were building out a cohort or community and you were providing people with product on a regular basis. Um, that's something like the Costco membership and that kind of thing, right? Okay. Any, are there questions, Kalina? Are we good? We do have one. Um, they had a, um, I don't know who the person's name is, but if I get it wrong, please forgive me. I think this is from Melody. When looking for per publishing, is it okay to apply to multiple companies at once? Yeah, so this is what's called simultaneous submissions. And you can absolutely do that with publishers um, and with agents and with literary journals. <laughs> um, you can apply to pretty much anybody. Um, there's a whole query process where you'll want to find out exactly what the publisher is looking for, why you think you might be a good match. And then you craft a really good query letter and uh, hopefully they will request some pages from you. I would, if you see a publisher that does not accept simultaneous submissions, I would probably reconsider submitting to that publisher um, because a lot of times they take a really long time to make a decision and you could have your query in with that publisher not have any idea that they've already said no they just didn't bother to tell you that um, and so I, I would probably be wary if they say they don't take simultaneous submissions the best way to find a publisher is to attend writers groups and make friends with other writers and be a good literary citizen sharing other writers work. And then when um, they then you find out who their publishers are. And then when you query them, you can say things like, um, I really liked After December, which you published Chrysalis Press. And I think that my book would fit in your catalog. And here's why um, that blind query can be really hard. A lot of times publishers are looking for a reason to say no, but there's a ton of tutorials out there about how to write a really good one and also how to make some connections. Um, one of my favorite stories right now is my friend Casey Lacourt, who hasn't written anything ever. Right. I mean, she's got short stories and like she's worked on some stuff, but she's never published anything. But she was going to all these writers conferences and she was meeting all these writers and all these publishers. And she started reading for one of the publishers in their slush fest. Like she would just tell them, hey, I'll just spend some time reading some of these queries. And if I think there's a good one, I'll send it to you. And they trusted her judgment. And now um, when she was talking to them over drinks one night about this idea she had for a story, they signed her for a three book deal over an idea. She hasn't even written anything yet, but it's just because she'd made this really good connection with this publisher. So I would consider uh, number one, figuring out what kind of book do you have? What kind of audience is your book written for? And then go looking for publishers that that's their audience, um, but they don't have a book like yours in their catalog. And then you wanna make the case that your book is the right fit for them because they're the their audience is the right audience, but they don't have a book like that yet. And then I would want to figure out um, specifically, uh, how do you get in front of that publisher so that they know you? Are they going to be at a conference coming up? Are they going to be you know, part of a workshop or something where you could walk up and introduce yourself um, so that they're not just saying no to a random email? They're um, having to say no to you and they know you and they like you. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a publishing tangent there, but. Okay, okay so that's, that's pretty much all we have for right now. Okay, cool. All right, so the model options, we went through that, and this is the business model canvas. And again, you might wanna either take a picture of this or uh, Google it, right? Um, and I'm just gonna quickly go through it because uh, really what we'll do in a longer session is we'll print these out for you and you can fill them out yourself, right? Um, but I just kinda wanna give you an idea of what the business model canvas does for you. So the first thing to notice is that it starts in the middle with the value proposition. So if we go back to our value proposition here, right? This, whatever we put in here as our value proposition, that's gonna go in this center block 
of the, of the business model canvas, the value proposition. What do we have to offer, right? What are we doing for our customer? What's the thing that we are offering our customer that they can't get anywhere else? The thing that provides them with gains, the thing that uh, takes away some of their pain, right? What is our value proposition? So it starts there in the middle, and then it works its way out to either direction. So we'll go from the middle to the left first. The key activities box is the things that only you can do. So this is great for artists because artists are um, primary creators of most of their work, right? What's the thing that only you can do? Well, only I can write the book, right? I can't find somebody else to write a book under my name. James Patterson has done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Danielle Steele has finally done it, right? Like there's a, there are authors out there that do have somebody else that are actually writing the book for them. But that's not the case for me and for most of my friends who are writers. We have to do the actual writing. Um, in Sunny's case, right, Sunny's a sculptor. So Sunny is, it does have this ceramics art piece, but he's also making um, cup, mugs and plates and things like that that should be repeatable because we wanna have a whole set. So he can make one, he can design the thing, and then he can teach somebody else how to make the matching pieces, right? So the key activity in Sunny's case would be the design. The key activity for me is actually the writing of the story, right? So think about your business and think about what has to happen uh, for your business. The, the, the only person who can do that is you. What are the key activities that you have to be the one to do? If there are other activities that have to get done to run the business, but you don't have to do them, that's where the key resources come in. So Sonny can't just hire anybody to make the rest of those coffee mugs, right? He needs somebody who knows ceramics, somebody who can do what he can do. And so he's got to be able to train somebody. That would be a key resource for him, somebody that he can teach how to do this thing for him. Plus, if he's creating on one kiln or on one um, wheel, he needs to have another wheel that's got access for this other person that's going to be doing the duplication stuff, right? And so now one of the key resources he needs is a second pottery wheel, right? So thinking about the key resources is how you say, okay, if I have to do these key activities, what are the key resources that I need to get somebody else to help me out with these things? And then to the far right, our key partners. So who are the individuals that are going to help you do this? Key partners can also be lenders. Uh, they can be your shipping partners, right? If you're gonna be mailing these things off, however you work out your shipping with FedEx and that sort of thing, those are your key partners. Um, does your mailman pick your stuff up and carry it to the post office for you? He's a key partner, right? Um, how do you pay for the product or pay for the inventory that you need? The lender that gives you that money, that gives you that 30 or, or net 60, those people are key partners. So you can be thinking about those folks as well. All right, back to our value proposition and then moving to the right, our customer relationships are how do we plan to retain our customers? So this would be things like your email list, right? Are you going to respond to them on Facebook? Are you going to respond to their comments on your Instagram page? Like, what are your customer relationships going to look like? Will you build a VIP customer set? Um, a lot of artists work very well with a VIP customer set. My VIP set is called the Teddy Ruxpin's Book Club. So and those of you who are Gen Xers like I am, you remember Teddy Ruxpin? He was the greatest absency parenting toy in the history of the planet. And so uh, Teddy Ruxpin was this little teddy bear that you put a tape in his chest and the tape would read the book to the kid, right? And so I called my, uh, my VIP group is my Teddy Ruxpin's book club. And Teddy Ruxpin's book club are those key people who are going to share my book with other people. Um, they're all, of course, on my email list, but they're also getting little tchotchkes from me and, and special behind the scenes pieces and things like like that too. So the customer relationships box is where you figure out, are you going to create an inner circle? And then who are your advocates going to be and your allies? And then how are you going to reward them? This is a big deal on Patreon. Um, the Patreon website has the way that you, these different levels of relationships that you have with your patrons, and they spend a lot of time talking you through that as well. The channels are how do you reach your customers? So are you going to utilize Facebook, Instagram, this kind of thing? Keep in mind that not all of your customers are on all of the platforms. So you wanna be very strategic about which channels you use. The customer segments are typically demographics, um, race, age, gender, um, socioeconomic status, right? Geography, these are your customer segments that say these are the folks I'm selling to and, and why. And then on the bottom, you can see the revenue streams and the cost structure 
nature offset one another. And the best thing I can say about this is that they should balance. So for everything you plan to spend money on, you should have a stream of revenue to offset it. If you're going to be subscribing to Canva software, for example, so that you can make graphics for your Instagram channel, then how are you going to pay for that Canva subscription, right? How am I going to cover my $12 a month that I'm paying to Canva? Be thinking about those revenue streams and also that cost structure. I know I kind of blew through that, but there's a lot of uh, videos associated with the business model canvas that will walk you through it in depth. Um, and if we get together for our half day session, we will give blank ones of these and we will work through them together. So business model canvas, you can find it anywhere. It's free. Just grab it off of uh, Google and fill it out and be giving some real thought to what your business looks like. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I talk to that have never filled out a business model canvas and we fill them out on the daily. <laughs> like in our business, every time we think about doing something new or creating a new revenue stream, we sit down and go, what's our value proposition? And we work through this. This is the kind of tool that you can use just to decide if you even want to go into business. If you've got a super enthusiastic friend that says, man, these chicken wings are so good. You should be selling them in a food truck. And you go, okay, let's think about that. What would it take to build a food truck business for my chicken wings? And you fill out this business model canvas and you start to realize that the cost structure for the food truck and the permits and the supplies, right? Plus the time that it's going to take you and the fact that you're going to have to be married to this thing every weekend versus how much money you're actually going to make, like 25 cents per wing. You're probably not going to want to do this food truck thing, right? And you get to the end of the exercise and you go, wow, glad we worked that out on paper instead of putting our life savings behind it and going bankrupt, right? So it's a good way to test your business idea and think, do I really have what it takes to be able to build this business? And if I don't, can I access those things that I need? So I just can't say enough about that business model canvas. I would really spend a lot of time with it. I mentioned one more entrepreneur here real quick, um, Reagan Teller. I think she's actually going to come, come and be part of our half day when we do the half day because she is here. She's local. Um, one of the things that happened for Reagan, and this is where I'm going to get into what I think Aisha is really waiting for me to talk about, which is the, the planning for emergencies. Um, but it comes on the other side of the business license conversation. One of the things with Reagan was that she was doing a lot of events and a lot of signings. And because she was going out in public and meeting her, her readers, when COVID hit and she couldn't do that, she really struggled with what that emergency was going to mean for her. All right. So right now I'm going to stop talking because I know we've got somebody here to talk about licensing. And this is the big question that comes up all the time. Do I need a business license? How much will it cost? How do I get it? How do they know I don't have it? And can I operate without it? And all those other suchness things. So I'll stop talking and uh, we'll introduce our, our visitor. Yes. Thank you, Casey. So we have uh, Katie Butler on the call from the, our business license department. Thank you so much, Katie, for being here. And you're going to provide us a, a brief overview of some of the business license requirements. You know okay, so I'm, I'm just moving this stuff off the screen here. <laughs> okay, so to apply for a business license, it's super easy. Um, our application is on our website, of course available for download. You can email it in. That's of course going to be your quickest way. Um, the email link is right above the link to download the application. Um, it's, it's pretty easy. It just depends on what you're doing um, as far as sales, whether you're going to be um, participating in so to city just one time and you wanna try it out, you can get a single event permit um, and that'll, that'll last you for 10 days um, or up to 10 days. Um, as far as these other specialty licenses that are available, I'm not sure how they would apply for artists per se, garage sales, obviously that's just somebody who lives within the city limits who's going to have a garage sale at their home. Um, a busker's license is going to be for um, performance arts. The one-year license is $15 for the entire year. Um, easiest way to do that is to come down to our office and get your picture taken so that we can go ahead and laminate your permit so that you can have it when you're out and about. Um, if you just want to try busking, you can, of course, do that for um, the the per day 
instead of the per year. So you can have that for three consecutive days. Say you want to go out to Soda City for the weekend, try it out, see how you do. That's definitely an option. Same process though, come on down to our office. We'll get you taken care of. Um, extended operating hours permits, that's more along the lines for um, the restaurants and um, lounge establishments that we have say in Five Points or the Vista um, so that they can stay open later hours. Um, and then as far as vehicles for hire, that's all as, you know, taxis, shuttles, things like that. So again, I'm not sure how that all applies for artists, but um, as far as an artist license, if you are based within the city of Columbia limits, just as a, a point of reference, um, your base rate for your business license is going to be about $48 and 40 cents. If you are based, um, excuse me, that was out uh, inside the city limits. And then if you're based outside the city, it's double. So it's 8470. So it all depends on what you're doing, where you're based and where you're working. Okay, and that you said um, you can send an application via back via email. What's the best email? Yes, yes. And we'll type that in in the chat. Sure, it's um all together one word: business license mail at Columbia SC dot gov. And what's the best number for someone to call if they have questions? So our main line is 803-545-3345. Okay. And um, we do have some questions in the chat for business license. Sure. Um, the first question is from, excuse me, from C. Scott Fitz. Um, she wants to know her husband applied for his business license over a month ago and he still has not received it. She wants to know how long does the process take? So depending upon the business activity, again, where you're based and what, what you're doing, um, if he has a commercial location, it could be um, in the inspections process. So um, if she wants to give our, our office a call, we'll happily check on that for them. Okay, um, the next question um, is from Pat McNeely. Um, mm -hmm. They want to know how much is the single event permit, the 10 day permit? The single event permit is $10. Okay, and the next question is um, CEH, can you provide the website address again? Sure, it's Columbia sc.gov, just like the email. Um, but you would just go to the departments and then business license and then look for new business license. And then once you get into that page, it's a big blue bold print and it's available for download for the application. Okay. And um, the next question is from Melody. Do you need a business license for online selling? If you are based within the city of Columbia limits, Yes, you would need a business license. Um, for the state of South Carolina, one license does not cover the whole state. It's all done by the area that you're working in or the municipality that you're working in. For example, in Richland County, um, there are several. There are Richland County, Arcadia Lakes, Forest Acres, City of Columbia, and a few more. Um, so it just depends on where all you are working. Um, say there's an event, in um, Forest Acres, you would need a Forest Acres license, not a City of Columbia license. However, if you're based in the city, you may need one here and there. Okay, okay uh, that is all the questions that we have right now, but if we do get more, we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay. Katie, thank you so much. She has very specific questions. You did a great job answering those, so we appreciate you joining our um, our Zoom call today, and um, we will provide all of that contact information when I send the follow-up email with the website and um, all the information that Katie provided. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie, for being here. Absolutely. All right, so the biggest question that most entrepreneurs have when they first get up and going is, how am I going to fund this? 
Um, if you're an artist, you've been finding a way to pay for your art for a long time. Uh, you might be uh, washing cars, right, to get money for paint um, or for colored pencils. Uh, most artists are finding a way to fund the creation of their art. But when we think about having to build the business out, you have expenses, right? So one of them is the business license. One of them is a website. One of them is going to be those transactional um, uh, capabilities, right? Square, uh, uh, being able to have, I think our biggest expense at our company for the longest time was QuickBooks, right? We pay $200 a year to use QuickBooks to run the company. So there's some funds associated with that. One of the questions in the Artist Venture Grant application was how do how what kind of funding are you going to need and what is the cost of all of this stuff so we're not going to spend a lot of time today breaking down cost of goods and and all of that but i will say that my primary advice and melissa knows this is true from the women's business center has always been sell something how do you plan to fund this sell something and begin by selling and selling and selling until you've got enough cash to be able to invest in some of these other things that you need. If you can fund your business with the cash that you're earning, then you will never have a problem with debt. You will never have a problem with bankruptcy. If you're not selling anything, you're not making anything, right? And so you shouldn't necessarily be building out a whole lot of inventory that you can't get rid of. If you're selling things, you're going to be making revenue. And so my suggestion has always been sell something. Now, then you've got expenses that become bigger, how you want to expand your business and you need some kind of investment in that business. And that's where the grants come in. And as artists, we're really, really fortunate because in our all over the world, right? People want to give money to artists. They want to provide opportunities for artists to start businesses. They wanna help you start a record label. They wanna help you start a radio station. They wanna help you start a, a, an art studio, right? All these things. And the three local places where you can look for funding for these particular artist ventures are, include the Arts Commission, I mentioned that before, and C. Scott Fitz is here, so she can speak to that maybe afterwards as we have a Q&A. They have an uh, annual grant cycle, and they have grants for a number of purposes. The South Carolina of Humanities is another one. They also have an annual grant cycle, and they have grants for a number of purposes. And of course, the City of Columbia's Office of Business Opportunities, which has various grant programs available for you. And I you should mention these in the beginning, but of course, you guys have a dedicated person to help people find the funding that they need and the funding that's appropriate for them. The two pictures on the back here are the Verizon um, grants opportunity and the FedEx grants opportunity. And I only put them there as examples of these national contests that are out there where you can submit your business idea, your business um, operations, like what's happening in your business right now and why you need the money. And then you can submit to this contest and they may very well pick you. And we have had people who have won those before. Uh, Grow with Google is a good example of a contest that you can win. And we have um, a friend of ours, a friend of OBO, Shanice Cleckley, who won a Grow with Google grant uh, in terms of being able to invest in her business, which at the time was a cupcake business, right? An online cupcake business. And so uh, it was, I think of it as art, right? I don't know, cupcakes are art. And uh, so there are these national programs that are out there um, and they're available to you. There's some links that we'll provide for you to go out and find them. But the best bet is to work with either OBO or the Women's Business Center or one one million cups or the small business development center, all of these resources that are available to you to help small businesses that will point you in the right direction of these contests and these potential uh, grant providers. The second thing I usually recommend after the sell something is crowdfunding. And crowdfunding is actually very, very successful for artists because people love to invest in art. They like to feel like they're helping somebody put beauty into the world. And so you can do crowdfunding at a number of different different levels for a number of different reasons. Sometimes we use crowdfunding to buy equipment. Um, sometimes we use crowdfunding to fund a new publication. So for example, Chrysalis is going to host a contest uh, and whoever wins the contest will get full publication, but we're crowdfunding the contest, right? Because you have to pay $20 to enter. And so all these people who aren't going to win are paying $20 so that the one person who does win actually gets published. So that's a way to crowdfund as 
well is create some kind of opportunity for another artist and have everybody else sort of try for that opportunity and then say, okay, well, here's your feedback. Here's why you didn't get it, but thank you for contributing to this other artist's um, capabilities or, or opportunity. Crowdfunding has um, been really effective for a company, an art company here in town called Caroline Guitar Company. I don't know if you're familiar with Caroline Guitar Company, but they make guitar pedals, like wah-wah pedals. And if you're a musician, you know what a wah-wah pedal is. Uh, if you're not, it's okay. You don't have to retain this information. But what Caroline Guitar Company makes is a product that helps guitarists get different sounds out of their instrument. And they use crowdfunding on the regular, pretty much every year or so, they're creating a new campaign and they're bringing in upwards of $10,000 for this crowdfunding. I mean, you can really earn a lot of money. And what the crowdfunding does is it has people giving in small amounts. So five, 10, $15 a piece. And then you give them some kind of benefit afterwards. Like maybe it's even just mentioning them as having been part of a successful campaign. Not People don't really need a lot um, in terms of recognition for having been part of a crowdfunding campaign. They like to know they're supporting an artist. So I would give that some thought. A lot of people take personal loans from their friends, from their family. Uh, this probably only gets really complicated if you're not able to pay that loan back. Um, a lot of times in the Women's Business Center, we would suggest to people, if you're going to take a personal loan, be very specific about what the money is for and how you're going to pay it back. If you make that contract with somebody that you know very well, then you want to be able to honor that contract and that will preserve your relationship with that person. You can also do personal loans through your bank um, and through other lenders that, as I'm sure the OBO can help direct you to lenders that are looking specifically for small enterprises they can invest in. You can take on investors. <laughs> um, the bigger companies usually do this in like a massive stock exchange where they'll put out, you know, we're going to go IPO, an initial public offering, and we're going to bring on investors. But you can actually get investors at a much smaller level. Um, and again, it just is a matter of paying them back um, through the profits that you're able to make or, or the dividends in some way. Um, and then finally, there are business loans available to you. I didn't put Patreon on here, but Patreon is a website that a lot of artists are using to crowdfund their particular efforts specifically musicians and content creators, uh, podcasters, right? Uh, we have a, the radio show, so we're using Patreon. And basically what patreon.com allows you to do is set up a donation portal where people can become members of your community. They can pay a certain amount of money and then you give them something in return. We do a behind the scenes feature of the radio show every week. So as soon as the radio show is over, uh, we hang up the radio and we open up a video and we start talking to our patrons. We give them some additional content. That's how we pay them back. So Patreon is definitely built for artists. It's built for creators. And a lot of the people that find us on Patreon, they weren't even looking for us. They were just sort of browsing through and they were like, oh, I'm a writer. I'm interested in writers. And they start paying us like a dollar a month um, to have access to our behind the scenes stuff. And $1 a month per person actually starts to add up after a while. And you can cash out your Patreon account at any time. So you can create for yourself a rolling um, income, or you can store a lot of money at Patreon. And when you need a big investment, you can take that money out and put it into the big investment. So Patreon is, a, is one I would highly recommend. There's not as much on the on the fees on Patreon as some of those other sites. Um, I'm sorry, Casey. If you no, can you're fine. Back. Go ahead. Uh, I yeah. just want to talk a little bit about the business of our office, Office of Business Opportunities. We do have commercial revolving loan funds available for um, artists, um, we'll be more than happy to talk with you about that. Um, if you want to contact us directly, I know that Kalina has put that information in our in the chat box for you um, for the business licensing. But we'll also input information in there for how to contact OBO directly um, for more information about those commercial loans. And you also have someone from the South Carolina Arts Commission that's on the call, CC. C. Yes. Scott Fitz. Yes, she's on the call. I didn't know she wanted to say anything about the grants that are available through um, the South Carolina Arts Commission. Uh, hi, uh, this is C. Hey. It's, uh, good. I don't know that my video is on. I guess it doesn't matter. Um, so I put some put in the chat. There is a lot <clears throat> that's going on in terms of uh, support for individual artists in South Carolina and the easiest thing would be for people just to reach out to me um, so that I can determine what their needs are and then uh, advise them on which grant is going to be best for them. Thank you. 
Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, so much opportunity there. Um, so I think as we were talking about the building out the business, if it started to feel sort of overwhelming, like, man, there seems to be like a whole lot of stuff to do. And I really just want to make my art. There's also a lot of people here to support you that want to help you be able to focus on your art and take some of these uh, problems or questions out of the way for you by putting you on the right path. Um, and certainly the the offer that we got, what we got from the Arts Commission, made all the difference for Write on SA, SC and was able to help us uh, really get that organized in a way that we probably hadn't thought too much about it before. We we're just kind of out there doing the radio thing because, you know, I like to be on the radio. Who doesn't like the sound of their own voice? <laughs> uh, all right. This is the emergency planning slide, Aisha. I told you it was coming. Um, so, so what happened? Well, all three of these businesses that I mentioned before, um, the first are Doggy Doingle's business. They're taking a short break. Uh, what happened during COVID, she was a student at Wofford University, had to focus instead on, you know, how do I navigate this new world and what does it look like? And so she, she's taking a break. Our friend Reagan Teller, who's an authorpreneur, she had spent most of her time at events, selling books through events, but there weren't live events to go to anymore, right, in terms of in person. So she partnered up with a group uh, with a gal named Chris Errol Ma, and they started holding digital events. So Words and Wine did, went digital, and they started leveraging this ability to Zoom like we are now, and was still able to sell her books and do readings and open mic nights and things like that. So she just had to pivot. And I mentioned before our Sunrise Artisan, you can see the cupcake soaps on the side over there, those cupcake bath bombs. They started getting really creative about, uh, about gift box and finding reasons to celebrate and talking to people about self-care and relaxation and why now is the perfect time to invest in a bath bomb habit, right? Uh, maybe something you hadn't had before. And so moving their business to a digital practice really helped them actually expand their business. You can't expect pandemic, right? Like none of us did. And even now, if we started to plan for the next pandemic, it's not going to be pandemic that's going to disrupt your business. What's going to disrupt your business is something you never saw coming, right? It could be something like a change in your family status, right? Um, you decide you're going to have a family, you'll have children. Um, now you need that space that you were using in your home for a studio that needs to be used instead for a nursery, right? You have less hours that you're able to, fewer hours you're able to dedicate to the creation side, things like that. So the question for you is to figure out how do you build the kind of stability into your art practice and into your business practice that when these disruptions come, you're able to kind of roll through them, right? You're able to figure out how to continue to do business on the other side of that emergency. And so I'm not going to beat into each of these. It's 128 um, and I never want to keep anybody past the time that we're supposed to be here. So that's the end of what I had to say today. Um, but I did just want to tease a little bit of these questions that we didn't answer today. But I think we can spend time a little bit longer together. Uh, and part of your survey after today's session is going to be asking whether you're willing to do that. Come on site with us for either a morning or an afternoon and really dig deeper into a few of these things. Like what does it inventory look like in your business? And how do you calculate the cost of goods, right? How do you know what your time is worth and what your in your specific art is worth. How do you monetize on digital platforms? How do you figure out whether or not your YouTube channel is getting enough hits or views or likes or shares to really turn that into a YouTube business? can't tell you how many people I know want to start a YouTube business and it is so much harder than it looks. Um, and then the last piece this here, can you be like the chefs, right? How do you create the kind of audience engagement that gives away what you can do, knowing that that's building the audience that will buy what you can do from you? More than anything, I just appreciate all of you as artists and your unique gifts that you have to offer Columbia, that you have to offer South Carolina. And if there's anything I can do ever to help advance your art and your businesses, please, by all means, let me know. Thank, thank you, you so case. much. This is awesome. Um, thank you again. I'll turn it back over to Ms. Furs. Yes, if there are any um, final questions we want to ask Casey, we'll take the opportunity to do that. Um, while you're thinking of your questions, I just want to say thank you to Casey. This was amazing. Like we knew it would be, you provided some very practical tips that our artists can apply today. So we really appreciate that. Um, one of the items that you mentioned was the Lean Canvas model. So um, you're gonna all receive an email from our office. If you registered, if you didn't register, please get sent, put your email in the chat box so we can make sure you get 
a copy of the presentation. I will also send you a survey. We definitely want to assess what we did well, what do we need to work on, what are some additional training needs you have. And Casey mentioned a more in-depth workshop. Um, so we definitely want to gauge interest on providing that workshop for the individuals here to kind of dig deeper into your specific business model. Um, I also sent a link to the recording of today's webinar so that you can go back and watch it um, and see if you missed anything while you were taking notes. It was a lot of great information and we look forward to providing that to you. Along with all the contact information that was provided, I'll make sure we add that as well. Um, I think that was it. So are there any, I see a couple of emails coming through. And I did receive the emails for individuals that want to be added to our newsletter. So I will add you to that so that you can start receiving um, those Aisha, newsletters on Fridays. Yes. I've saved the chat. I'm going to shape the chat. So I'll send it to you so you'll get all the emails. Excellent. 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 We love seeing all this interest. Um, we definitely want everyone to know that we are a resource available to our artist community. And we want to do whatever we can to um, provide you with the resources that you need to continue to expand and grow your business. Um, Casey, do you have any final words? I just want to say thank you to Sunny for letting me use you as an example. And um, I hope things are going really well with your business down in Charleston. <laughs> as soon as I saw you come in, I was like, I'm going to talk about him this whole time. He had no idea. <laughs> but did anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, uh, we have a question. Okay. Um, this is for our office. Either you or Melissa can answer this. Um, Andrea Butler wants to know if the OBO office has any resources or webinars for public relations, branding, or marketing. Um, so currently, the upcoming webinars we have are specific to um, financial uh, structure of your business. But um, I would love to send you an email. Maybe we can connect and kind of talk about what your needs are, or if that's something that um, that you're interested in. So um, I will reach out to you, Andrea. Is, I, yep, I have your email address right here. So we can have a um, conversation. Thanks for having us today. I think it was really good. Um, if anybody need, has any other questions, I mean, we can always connect to resources as well, um, both the ones at the Art Commission. Um, we deal a lot in busker licenses um, and, and communicating the information about busker licenses. Um, and we've even got some other details about business licenses on our website, onecolumbiasc.com. And then uh, if anybody wants you, you know, are out doing events and activities, please make sure you can sign up for a artist uh, profile uh, page on our website. And that is also presented on the Richmond Libraries um, website. And then you can also uh, add events um, when you're having them and we will help market those. So thank you. Thank and you. And I also want to recognize Tanya is on the phone and Carla is, is on the phone. So that's those are the OBO teammates um, that are here also. Melissa, so, I'm sorry. Um, Miss um, Scott Fitz, she has her hand raised. I'm sorry. Hi. See Scott Fitz, she has okay. her hand oh, raised. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know on the call that I am working with uh, Lee over at One Columbia and the Richland Library to uh, start a series next year called the Artist Entrepreneur Incubator. These are going to be 90 minute workshops um, that begin hopefully September, or October, and they will be discipline based on uh, how to survive and sustain yourself as an artist in your particular yes. discipline. That's great to hear. Um, that is awesome. Just wanted to let everyone know to be on the lookout for that and uh, contact me if you want some more information. Casey, I need to talk with you uh, about this and everything else that's going on. Yeah, let's get together soon. Um, okay. and that, yeah. I would love to be part of that on the literary arts side. I'd, I'd be glad to be part of that. Okay, wonderful. Awesome. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thank you. And, and thank um, Business Licensing also for joining us. Um, and Shannon for being a part of this call. Um, thank you, everybody. All thank right. you. Have a great, great day. day.